stay late in conference and stay late in game, so I really appreciate it. My name is Jen Fillane, I'm a PhD student at the University of New Hampshire, and I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about a sometimes overlooked aspect of biostudents' interns, which is the quality of transcriptional assemblies. Um, so I know that I don't need to convince anybody in this room why we should want to build biogenies, um, but just to recap, there are an amazing tool for learning about evolutionary history, either of a group of organisms or a group of humans. Um, but we can also use them to find instances of novelty, like this uh, sort of light colored finch in the middle of all these dark ones, or instances of conversions, like some of the barrel shapes, perhaps. And we use them as a jumping off point for so many other downstream analyses that having a really um, reliable core biology can be really, really important. So we hope when we build biogenetic trees, we can like this. This is a pretty good model, a pretty good representation of what this tree probably looks like in real life. Um, and it's well defined, and it has nice bifurcating branches, and it holds a lot of information. And we can feel really confident in the different kinds of inferences and downstream analyses that we're drawing from, from this type of biogenetic tree. But sometimes we think we're building trees that look like this, when in reality, they look more like this. And this one is a lot less well defined. Um, it, uh, there's a lot more ambiguity present, and it's probably not a very good model of what this tree might look like in real life. <coughs> so there are lots of things, lots of different ways that we can end up making this more biased tree as opposed to this one, and, and all of these uh, can introduce error and introduce bias in a lot of our downstream analyses. So this is sort of a phylogenomic pipeline that we talk about and think about a lot in phylogenomics, um, and we've heard about a lot of these over the course of this conference. So we find ortho groups, we pull ortho logs out of those ortho groups, then we can build an alignment out of those. We often spend a lot of time and energy thinking about model selection, as we should, um, and then the tree building process itself is not necessarily immediately straightforward. But I'm here to remind everybody that there's actually a lot more included in this pipeline. This is not an exhaustive list. And at every single different stage of this pipeline, we have the opportunity to introduce biases and to introduce error into our phylogenetic inferences. Um, so the one that I'm going to focus on today is, is this assembly uh, black oval here. And I'm choosing to focus on this one, partially, especially transcriptome assembly, um, partially because people are using transcriptomes more and more in their phylogenetic analyses, but also because uh, there are really good tools already in place to detect errors here and uh, plenty to correct for them if we find that they are making a difference. So let's just zoom in on the assembly process for a minute. Um, this is actually not the process. This is a lot of things that can go wrong with this process. Um, so there's you know, quite a lot to choose from. Uh, at its very basic, we can just have chimeric transcripts where uh, the assembler has stuck together two things that belong in different transcripts, but they look sort of fused and become one. We can also have things like family collapse at the right corner, um, where maybe an entire ortho group of things have been collapsed into a single transcript. That's certainly an error that you would find in transcription assemblies. It can even be something as simple as local mass assembly, where the read pairs have been put in the wrong orientation to one another. So all of these things can go wrong, and so no one should use transcription assemblies, and they can all just go wrong. Um, but luckily, there's a program that can detect these things, um, and that can be used to evaluate that transcription assembly. It's called Transrate. I'm setting it down at the bottom, and I'm also stealing all these figures from it. And, um, and Transrate, basically just takes a de novo transcriptome assembly, takes the reads that you use to make that assembly, and maps those reads onto that assembly. So based on the way the reads map, it can detect all of these errors, and, um, and then it assigns each individual transcript a score from 0 to 1, based on how well it was assembled, and then it also uh, assigns the transcriptome as a whole a score, based on all of those individual scores. So, um, so it's a really great way to look at the structural contiguity especially of a transcription assembly. Um, so what I'm really interested in is, given all of these things that can go wrong in a transcription assembly, how are these errors potentially introducing bias into the phylogenetic inferences that we're drawing uh, downstream? And so in order to look at this, I'm going to take you through my pipeline, talk about the data set that I've made to look at these questions, and then show you some preliminary results. So again, this is the pipeline. I am um, not going to focus on the first three aspects of this today, and then the second three aspects are actually going to be combined into one set, which I'll talk about more in just a second. So 
this is my pipeline, and that's why it's a little bit shorter. I'm using publicly available data, but I need control over everything up to the sequencing point. Um, and then using joint proof protocol to do the, uh, the terminate error correcting and actual assembly of the transcriptome. Um, I'll talk more about that just in a minute. Then I'm using OrthoFinder to plot ortho groups, stylish tree pruners to plot the ortho logs. I'm using math for aligning, and then a combination of IP tree, rational, and phylo base to do the actual tree vision itself and control the amount of trees. So, just a quick word on the ortho group protocol. This is a process that's been developed by one of my advisors, Matt McManus, over the past couple of years. And it will take you from uh, raw transcriptome reads all the way through to a quality test transcriptome assembly. So the way that it does this is first by trimming and error correcting using the very best practices that we know of at this point. Then it actually splits off and assembles the transcriptome reads using four different assemblers. So there are two different measurements to choose. Um, twice it's stayed at different Hamer lengths. Once you turn to this, then it selects the very best transcripts from each of these sub-assemblies and merges them into the Oyster Room Protocol assembly down here. And at the end of this process, you're left with five separate transcriptome assemblies, um, which, which I've built which are in these built-in boxes. Then you can run Transrate, which I talked about earlier, and Gusto, which is a great way of looking at the genus and species of your transcriptome assembly. Um, and so at the end of the day, you have quality metrics for each of these five assemblies. And what this allows me to do is to choose the assembly with the very worst trans rate score and put it in my bad data set, and the assembly with the very best trans rate score and put it in my good data set. And so the whole process that I'm going to be talking about from now on, I've run everything in parallel using these two sets. So these are some of the organisms that I'm actually using in my data set. I have 33 species of chordates that I'm currently working with. We chose chordates for lots of reasons. One is that this is the genetic information available for them, um, so we can get a pretty good sampling across, across that particular tree. Another reason is that it's a, it's a fairly well-resolved tree already, so if something goes totally weird with one or more of our trees, we should be able to tell pretty quickly. Um, and uh, so I, I also have two non-vertebrate chordates, and, uh, and so I, and again, this, everything on the, on the good data set side under this better tree over here, it has the very best transcriptome assembly, by trans rate score, and all of this stuff over here in the bad data set has the worst. So apart from that, they're identical. Um, so one of the first things we wanted to look at was just alignment length, and this is actually work that's been done by an awesome undergrad that's working with me, Sherlock Waits. Um, he's really interested in looking at other kinds of quality metrics, so he's been looking, and he's been using RNA plot to uh, actually align the, the fully assembled transcripts back onto their reference genomes. So, um, so these are just showing those alignment lengths, um, the distribution of those anyway. And these dotted lines depict the means. And as you can see, the good data set has significantly longer on average uh, alignment lengths than the bad data set does. So um, this doesn't necessarily mean anything in and of itself, except that it's probably a more contiguous assembly. Um, but what this actually leads to when you get slightly farther down the pipeline after you run it through OrthoFinder is that there's a drastic difference in the number of ortho, ortho groups with all the taxa represented. And since these are the ones I was going to have used to go on and make them trees, it's already there's a pretty serious difference here. So the good data set has almost four times the number of these ortho groups that the bad data set does. Um, but it is worth noting that the bad data set still does have almost 600 of these ortho groups present, um, which, as it turns out, is quite enough to make the trees look pretty similar. Um, so uh, these, this is the good tree over here on the left side and the bad tree over here on the right. Um, you can see that even their relative tree certainties are pretty similar. Uh, there are a couple of differences. If you look at the fish clade, they have slightly different relationships there. And, um, and the mammals are quite different. But honestly, in either tree, they look a little strange. So, um, so I think this is really a product of the fact that I use the model to make these trees that was fast, not necessarily one that fit the data really well. So I have a much slower model uh, trees running right now, but since that's happening in, in Bayesian space, maybe by the time evolution happens next year, I'll have those trees. <laughs> um, so what does this mean? Well, we know that good quality assemblies yield richer data sets, almost, almost 400% richer, it seems like. Um, but so in our case, the bad quality data set still does have enough genetic elements to resolve most of the trees, at least especially the major groups. Um, this may not be true of more divergent data sets. 
I normally look at all across Metazoa, and uh, so that's a much uh, longer diversion time. And so I'm really excited to try the same process at different scales. Um, also, I think potentially a, a really, really shallow scale for every different chunk in each chunk. Um, it might also be something right at that, at that scale. I also want to look at branch length differences between the good and the bad data set trees. Um, there's some preliminary evidence that, that seems to point to the fact that the good tree has slightly longer branch lengths. And this can make a really big difference if you're in between diversion times or, or really in time, times on trees for any reason. Um, and I also have a third data set that just contains the Trinity uh, assemblies. And this is meant to serve sort of two purposes. One is that it sort of provides a really good middle ground assembly, since sometimes Trinities are the best and sometimes the other the worst. Um, but it's also uh, meant to sort of replicate a more typical use, since Trinity is the most popular transcriptor assembly that's being used. So lots still to do. Um, so I really just want to thank my lab. These are all of the members of that lab that are here today, especially uh, my advisor, John Tanis, and Troy Rapolis, who I've had been working with me diligently on this project for a few months now. Um, I'd also like to thank my other lab, the Vitex Lab, um, the other members of my committee, and the people who help me out on a daily basis, especially Tony Westbrook, and, uh, and my family and Thank you guys so much. Thank you, guys. <laughs> 